Do you feel you are blessed to be back here? Amen. I welcome you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are, you and I should be considered that we are the blessed ones because today there are many people who are mourning over the death. There are sick people who want to come to church, glorify God, but they cannot because they, are, they feel weak. But here you are, firm, strong, confident enough to glorify God. Amen. God, may God bless each and every one of us. And let us, I want each and every one of us to come and join us in singing. This morning, the, we, the worship team, we decided to come up with the old songs that we have been singing so far. And I believe, except for those of us who are new here, I believe that every one of us knows the songs that we're going to sing this morning. So I want you all to be confident and join us in singing whatever song that we're going to sing. Before we go into our song, I would like to invite our friend Missy to read a Bible passage for all of us. Psalms 149, verse 6 to 9. May the praise of God be in, in our mouths and a double-edged sword in, in our hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with feathers, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all his saints. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you are heavy this morning with a burden, let us bring it to God. We never know when we are singing, you might get healed. When you are singing, God might speak to you through the songs. So I want you all to come and join us in singing. Come, now is the time to worship. I want to invite you all to stand and join us.
next song that we are going to sing is taken from Psalm number 150. It's the Psalms of David. He, when he prays, he prays God, saying, Praise Him, you heaven and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly host. Every creature, let the whole earth praise Him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The next song that we're going to sing is Great in Power. to God. No matter how mighty, how powerful, how rich, or how luxurious our life is, or how comfortable it is, we can never forget God. Because above all those things, above all those treasures, above all those mighty, above all those richness, it is God who blessed us all. I want us all to close our eyes and Sing with us, meditate with us as we sing above all, thinking about, reflecting, retrospecting our life, how you have been blessed, how God has been the greatest treasure in our life. Let's all prayerfully sing above all.
So we can live with you. We can live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us this gift of life. Yes, Lord. I pray for those family who are mourning over the dead. 
There are people who are crying, Lord Jesus, seeking for your healing, Lord. There are people who are seeking for your wisdom, Lord, because they are lost. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. There are people who are depressed, down with life, Lord. There are many people who wanted to give up on life. I pray, Jesus, that you will speak to them today. That's because they are yet to know you, Lord. There's none to speak to them. Lord Jesus, I invite your Holy Spirit to go and comfort them today. At this moment, I pray for them, Lord, that you will comfort their hearts, that you will wipe away the tears. I pray that, Lord, you will be the parents of, of the orphans, be the wife and husband of the widows and widowers. Be the siblings of those who are lonely. Be the friends of those who are friendless. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity that you have given us. So we can pray for them. We can remember them. We can remind them once again that you are always there. Your cross is there. And you died for us. You shed your blood for us. Lord, at this very moment, I invite and speak the healing over the sick. Speak the comfort over the depressed. May your Holy Spirit take control over their life. And may you bring warmness and comfort into their life. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's all sing crucify together. us all. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Watchna Church this morning. Please prepare your hearts to listen to the Lord's word today. Call to worship today is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 29. Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Next is prayer and confession by our pastor, Ajahn Ann Gregory. This is the month that <clears throat> Most of the churches throughout the Church of Christ in Thailand observe as the month of Lent. But today we will observe the final Sunday of Epiphany when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain and he had three disciples with him. 
At least they thought he was transfigured. And whenever we see the brightness of God, we are reminded of our own failings, our own shortcomings. And yet the scripture tells us how to bring that to God. And so, listen to these words from the book of Lamentations, verse 5, uh, chapter 5, selected verses. Lord, consider what has become of us. Take notice of our disgrace. Look at it. The crown has fallen off our head. We are doomed because we have sinned. Because of all this, our heart is sick. Because of these things, our glance is dark. Let us take a moment of silence and bring before God our shortcomings, our failings, our longings, and our repentance. Listen to these words from Psalm 99, selected verses. O Lord, you are great in Zion. You are exalted over all the nations. Let them thank your great and awesome name. You are holy. Moses and Aaron were among your priests, Samuel too among those who called on your name. They cried out to you, and you answered them. You spoke to them from a pillar of cloud. They kept the laws and the rules you gave to them, O Lord, our God. Magnify the Lord, our God. Bow low at God's holy mountain, because the Lord, our God, is holy. <clears throat> Let us continue together in prayer. O oh God of glory, it is by your invitation that we are here together this morning. You are the creator of all things, great and small, and yet you care for us. You are nearer to us than our own breath. And yet we feel our weaknesses heavily upon us and in our hearts. We grow sleepy in the presence of your greatness. We cannot stand before you. We pull a shade over our eyes, over our hearts, at your glory. And still, because of your love, you sent to us your Son, Jesus, the Anointed One, to show us your ways, to show us your heart. You sent him to be the light of the world, and his light shines in the darkness. We remember the words of the Apostle Paul that we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. And yet your glory is with us even though we see it dimly. What glory that you are truly here with human beings in all your power, all your shining, all your mercy, all your love. Strengthen your people everywhere, we ask, to share your holy light, to bring blessings and healing to a world that needs it 
so badly. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who spoke with compassion and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The words of the Lord from Exodus chapter 4, uh, 34, uh, verse 29 to 35 says that Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two covenant tablets in his hand, Moses didn't realize that the skin of his face shone brightly because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw the skin of Moses' face shining brightly, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called them closer, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and Moses spoke with them. After that, all the Israelites came near as well. And Moses commanded them everything that the Lord had spoken with him on the Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went into the Lord's presence to speak with him, Moses would take the veil off until he came out again. When Moses came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see that the skin of Moses' face was shining brightly. So Moses would put the veil on his, his face again until the next time he went in to speak with the Lord. So today, let us listen to the sermon today by our faithful uh, pastor, Reverend and Gregory, please. The story of the Transfiguration for today is from the Gospel of Luke. But I realize we need to hear what came before it because the story starts out saying, about eight days after Jesus said these things. What things? So we'll back up in Luke chapter 9 and begin with verse 18. And we will see how closely together some of these stories are and how they open up the meaning to us. So beginning with verse 18 of Luke chapter 9, once when Jesus was praying by himself, the disciples joined him and he asked them, who do the crowds 
say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, and still others that one of the ancient prophets has come to life. He asked them, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Christ sent from God. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone. He said, the human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Jesus said to everyone, <clears throat> All who come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross daily and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me will save them. What advantage do people have if they gain the whole world for themselves, yet perish or lose their lives. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see God's kingdom. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with them were almost overcome by sleep. But they managed to stay awake and saw his glory, as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, but he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless. And at the time, they told no one what they had seen. The next day, when Jesus, Peter, John, and James had come down from the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to take a look at my son, my only child. Look, a spirit seizes him, and without any warning, he screams. It shakes him, it causes him to foam at the mouth, it tortures him 
and rarely leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to throw it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered, You faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him down and shook him violently. Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. Once, many years ago, I think it was the first year I was out of college, I went back to the chapel of my college to hear the St. Matthew Passion, which is a long oratorio by Johann Sebastian Bach, perhaps the greatest composer who ever lived. The St. Matthew Passion was written to be sung on Good Friday. It lasts more than two hours, like Handel's Messiah, which many of you have heard in this very sanctuary in December every year for many, many years now. The St. Pa Matthew's Passion is an amazing work of music, and it is holy. I was seated up in the balcony, and the sound was all around me. And you know, Bach wrote this piece for double choir, two choirs, and double orchestra, two orchestras. In the very last piece of the St. Matthew Passion, the final choir piece, the very end, the two choirs sing a song of sorrow, a song of tears, at the tomb of Jesus. He is not raised in this piece of music. That comes later, but not in this piece of music. He is in the tomb. And the last note was sounded and held out, and the whole audience was holding its breath. We were holding our breaths for that holy moment of awe and silence before everyone begins to applaud the performance. And two rows in front of me, before that moment of silence even had a chance to begin, an old man turned to his wife and said, well, it's over. Those of you who are lovers of music will know what an awful thing that is. I was hoping that no one would try to hurt him on the way out. Actually, I was hoping that I would not try to hurt him on the way out. So I found myself remembering that moment. Well, it's over. <laughs> when studying the story of the transfiguration in these past few days, could, have, could it have been a little bit like that when Peter started talking? Jesus had brought him and John and James up the mountain to see something so holy and so almost shattering. The only right response, the only proper thing to do would have been to keep silence. But no. 
Peter was nervous. Peter got rattled, and he started trying to think. Okay, he was thinking out loud, like a lot of extroverts do. Started trying to think of ways to put the whole earth-changing moment into a safe box, or maybe into a bottle, as if he were trying to keep that holy moment as a souvenir. In Thai, we would say, Tira look. But the voice of God stopped Peter in his tracks. And the cloud that came over him and the other two disciples also caused Peter to be silent. And the voice of God said in that moment, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. <laughs> Apparently not to Peter. But it's also possible that what the voice of God was saying is that this is my son. He surpasses Moses and Elijah, the greatest of your ancestors. That wouldn't surprise us as Christians today, but in those days that would have been shocking. Jesus, this country rabbi traveling around and teaching, suddenly becomes more important than the greatest prophet and the lawgiver of Israel. How could that be? Last week, I talked about the thin place, the idea that comes to us from the Celtic tradition, the Scots and the Irish and the Bretons and the, the Welsh and the people from Galicia in Spain, the thin place, the place where heaven and earth almost meet. And you can almost reach through and touch the holy. There are many places in the world that human beings have found that seem that way to us. And this week we hear of one of the thinnest places of all, when Jesus was transfigured and Moses and Elijah appeared with us. But scholars tell us that Luke never used the word transfiguration when he was writing in the original Greek language. The word he used was really more like revelation. Transfigured means to be changed. Revelation means to be revealed, to be shown for the truth. So, as I suggested, it wasn't Jesus who was changed that day. It was the disciples. He was revealed. Something happened so that the disciples saw him for who he really was, who he really is. A great shining being who was right up there with the most important of all the ancestors, Moses and Elijah. We can't even talk about it with enough respect because we make the story smaller and it is not small. But I want to say something about the experience of the thin place. Some of us have had experiences like that, a moment that seemed so holy that we never could forget. And God was so close. But due to some conversations I had last week after the service, I found that some were disappointed. They thought that, are we all supposed to have found the thin place? Do we have to find the thin place in order to be true followers? 
of the way of Jesus Christ? No, of course not. Most of the people in the salvation history of Scripture did not have these powerful experiences, and yet they believed, and yet they followed. They might have grumbled a lot while they were following, but they still trusted. And I was reminded of the story in John's Gospel when Jesus has been raised and he appears to his disciples, and it's not the first time, because the first time Thomas, the one they called the twin, had not been with them. And when they all said, well, we've seen him, he said, nah, hmm. I won't believe that until I see him and touch him, touch his wounds. And suddenly Jesus appeared to them again. This is in John's 20th chapter. And remember what Jesus said to Thomas. He said, so you believe because you've seen me. Happy are those who have not seen but who believe. So experiencing a thin place is not a requirement. It is a joyful miracle of God. One preacher tells the story of when he was a little boy. For his science project in school, he made what he called a prism box. It's, I think, three pieces of glass in a triangle together. And when the light shines on the glass, it splits into a rainbow. And the rainbow shows us that what we see with our eyes is a, just a small, small part of what is true all around us. Because what we see is the white light, but it has all those colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So perhaps we should not judge by what our eyes can see. Because the truth is we cannot judge only by what our eyes can see. Our eyes tell us that the sun travels across the sky and then goes down and sets in the evening. But science tells us that that's not what's happening at all. We are traveling around the sun and turning and spinning ourselves so that every day is a day that we have spun all around and every year is a year that we have gone around the sun. This is what the scientists tell us. But we can't see it. So why do we imagine that we can see the other people around us clearly and know who they really are and be able to judge them? Obviously, we're missing so much. What if, what if, could it be possible that all of us in our real selves are these bright, shining beings of light? but we can't see it. We can't see it yet. The disciples were blessed enough, those three disciples, not the twelve, those three, were blessed enough to see it. For a few moments they saw who Jesus really is. Would any of us be as bright and shining as he is? Well, <laughs> probably not. But perhaps in the day of the Lord, we will be by the grace of God. And even now, if you have given your life to following the way of Jesus Christ, you may be brighter and more beautiful in the eyes of God than your neighbors or your friends or your family can possibly see. Same for your neighbors or your friends or your family. 
they may well be brighter and more beautiful in the sight of God than anything you can see. But I wonder, why did Peter get in trouble for wanting to build some beautiful shrines, some lovely buildings, churches? I, I don't know what he was thinking. And Luke tells us Peter didn't either know what he was thinking. Why is the story a little bit sardonic, a little bit sarcastic there? Peter said this, so he didn't know what he was saying. Makes us smile because we know that we are like Peter. Maybe he got in trouble because the holy, the thin place, the thin places do not come to make us comfortable and help us to just feel wonderful. The thin place challenges us to get moving. Yes, it is important to see the glory and the shining of our God. And of course, even those of us who have had great miracles still see God's glory dimly compared to what will come in God's future. It is important to know that Jesus shines brighter than the sun or the stars. But it is even more important to be part of what Jesus does. He goes back down into the valley where people are hurting. And that is what the story tells us. He went back down into the valley. And that is what he asks of us who follow him. Peter, James, and John might not have wanted to go right back down into the valley. But the place where people are hurting is where God keeps asking us to be. Jesus was not revealed only as one who is bright and shining and powerful and lifted up. He was also revealed as one who heals, who makes broken people into one piece again. So, how are we going to treat the people we see in our everyday life? How are we going to treat them if only we knew what God sees, if you only knew what you look like to God, what do you see? Next is offertory. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the flat gates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. From Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Please remain seated while singing the song, Transform Us as You Tra as you transfigured.
God of glory. You do not live in buildings made by human hands, not in temples, not in shrines, not in churches. Forgive us for trying to make you in our own image. Forgive us for trying to make you small instead of giving ourselves to be made more and more in your image. Set us free to give not only of our money, but our lives and our future, to share what we have and who we are for your work and your will. And bless these gifts we bring today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand once more and let us say together the words of the Apostles' Creed as found in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. It is Christ who invites us to eat together in this holy communion. And one of the many reasons we do this is so that we remember that although the brightness of God may be too much for us to look upon, or at least to look upon for very long, God has also created small things and humble things, and God loves all of creation. Even this humble bread that we share, and this fruit of the vine, that we drink together. This is the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany, the season when we remember how God's glory flashed out in the life of Jesus again and again. Our prayer at this table is that we could see, that we could really see others as God sees them as God sees us as we eat and pray and work together let us keep looking for flashes of God for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this for the remembrance of me.
Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Good morning once again. I'm here to make an announcement, but before that, uh, I would like to thank all the uh, all those who have participated in this morning, as well as who are here joining worshiping with us. At the same time, I also would like to uh, welcome those of us who are here for the first time, or those who are here as a visitor, like coming back or joining our service after a long time. So if there's anyone who is here for the first time, can you kindly stand and show us your face? If there is anyone who is here for the first time. I, I would like to ask our ushers to hand them over the visiting card so that they will fill in their names. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And you are welcome in our service. And after the service, we have a coffee fellowship. So I would like to ask all of you to join 
our coffee fellowship. After the coffee fellowship, we have Bible study, one with Achan Wurji, and that is the study from the book of Corinthians, and another one is with our pastor, Reverend Ann, that is introduction to the Christian faith. So if you're interested, then please come and join for the Bible study. And after the Bible study, we have um, lunch fellowship, so be a part of that lunch fellowship and be blazed. A um, few announcements. Uh, the Lent, or this coming Wednesday is, uh, is the Ash Wednesday, and we have a combined service with the Thai congregation, and we will be provided with the um, translation, right? English translation, so. No, on, on Wednesday, yes. On Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. It will be here at the century and you will be provided with this translation as well. So please come and join the service. That is on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Um, and on Wednesday, we will also uh, hand you over the Lent booklet that we have prepared for the Holt Lent period. So the, bo the book will be available by Tuesday, but since um, we all gather only for the service, Maybe those who come on Wednesday, we will hand, them, uh, hand you over the booklet on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evening, if not next Sunday. Okay, um, another announcement that is we plan to start our youth ministry. And I have been approaching to the families, to the parents who have their children from age 12 to 18. So if you have children from 12 to 18 who are willing to join, the youth ministry, please um, come and meet me or Ajahn Ann so that we can see how much we have and how, what we can do with the youth ministry. Shall we all stand to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Now may the God of creation bless you and keep you. May the face of our Savior shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the light of God, the Holy Spirit, be upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.